just um, before we embark on the discussion around the publication of RAW, um, I would like to invite each of the participants to introduce themselves um, and a brief outline on what their um, chapter entails. Um, and I'm going to do it in the order in which they appear in the book. So, okay. so if um, Camilla can start um, introducing your and Rebecca's chapter. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to to have a discussion. I am an art writer and a curator of research. I wrote the test of Balestra. Balestra uh, was a superb artist and a good friend. I want to let I start also a question or stop it. No, this is uh, this is perfect. So this is uh, ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, Rebecca and Camilla's. Um, and then the next um, chapter is um, from, these are some of the images from Rebecca's and Camilla's chapter. The next chapter is uh, from Fiona Parry, who unfortunately can't um, join us for the discussion today, um, but she is a curator at Turner Contemporary where she curated an exhibition called Animals and Us. Um, and the essay chapter that she um, has uh, developed for the raw publication um, speaks about four different contemporary artists that work with ideas around the kind of um, embodiment of a position of um, human and animal relationships. Um, so she speaks about Marcus Coates, Pierre Huyg, Marguerite Timur and Diana Thacker. Um, so the next person I would like to do introduce is uh, Kai. Um, Kai, you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> okay, I was trying to be good. <laughs> I'm Kai Loscott. Uh, my chapter is called Crop Marks and Vanishing Points. Um, it's a, an exploration of visual research. So there wasn't meant to be a text. There is a short introduction text now to contextualize it. And uh, it's about the book as a grid, in a sense. And everything that's not in the book, which is this, for instance, or a whole lot of other things that we consider peripheral to the book when we have it in our hands. But the materiality of the book is very different. Uh, in an ecological sense, to what's apparent when we hold it. So, that's me. There are just a couple of images from Kai's chapter. So um, the next person we would like to um, introduce is Uli to introduce your um, joint chapter, collaborative chapter with um, Angelica. Hello from Berlin. And I was uh, actually invited from Angelica Böck. She, uh, she's not able today to join us, which is unfortunately. And um, we, we were working, we, I know Angelica since quite a long time. And I know her work about um, uh, the, the, the self-portrait in different societies. Um, I just like to say a little bit that she used to live in Borneo for seven years and she had a blog back then and where she was um, working and publishing about the daily life in Borneo. And she also used to live with um, with people from there, with, in, uh, with indigenous people. And um, she, Angelica, got interested in my work because I started five years ago uh, a project called One Million, where I work with porcelain and porcelain is a political material. And we established a conversation on survival on each level. And so for the project for Roar, we, uh, we joined our works, um, yeah. So this is what you what you find there, and, and we had um, 
we were mainly talking about these topics you can find in the in the books about um, issues we were interested about globalization survival and um, power all those uh, topics we are we have to deal with in in our daily life as well as artists Fantastic. Thank you, Uli. Yeah. Um, I mean, so the next, mm -hmm. the next chapter is uh, Michael. So you're Hi. on. Hi. Okay. Hi. Yeah. My, my um, chapter was on the West Coast writer, Michael McClure, who sadly died a year ago, um, widely associated with the beat generation of writers, that, that group of experimental poets and novelists that emerged in the post-war era in New York and San Francisco. And the chapter looks at his quite extraordinary poetry that enshrines an interest in the links between biology and language. And in the performance of the poem, attempts to renegotiate those species boundaries between the human and the more than human world. Thank you, Michael. Um, and the next chapter is from Lisa. Hi. Um, yeah. Um, the I was I was initially I was quite surprised that you invited me to the publication because uh, sustainability is not really something that I think really was like a focus of mine. Um, I was really interested in in work and labor. Um, and the maybe also the the political connections or the the sociological connections. Um, and uh, I was really busy with these books that uh, are part of of my chapter uh, and holding holding the books and maybe a connection to to Kai's uh, um, contribution, like how how to reference the the sources that we are busy with in, in our works and to make them visible. And uh, what I felt really striking was in a way how my contribution also seems to fall out of the, 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 the rest of the book a little bit. Um, and I think it's really interesting um, that that happens. And um, yeah, I think the, the, the connection to the hand and how we are, um, how we are actually as humans connected with the with the physical world, uh, and and how that has a history, and how the history or looking from our present at at past events, maybe that also gives an idea of how we could look at future future events or how we will look back at our present from the future. Um, yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, the next uh, chapter is Marina. Hello, I'm uh, Marina Vélez. I'm a researcher, artist. I'm based in Cambridge, and I co-edited the, the book and co-curated the book with Rosanna. Um, and my contribution to the book was um, about preoccupation of uh, animals um, um, how the relationship between human um, species uh, with with the other uh, species in in the planet and uh, the exploration visual exploration of the distancing and pro proximity of that encounter or sometimes a lack of encounter understanding or lack of understanding um, and how uh, other connections could be made uh, and exploring that in in a way combining different images um, but sometimes um, mixing uh, images taken from um, social media, uh, family albums, um, um, encyclopedias, um, in, uh, all uh, uh, images that I took in my fieldwork research. So um, it's kind of a collage of, of things that patching together partial reparations of our relationship with other species. Thanks, Marina. Um, so the next chapter is mine. I'm Rosanna Greed. Um, I'm an artist and lecturer at Cambridge School of Art. And 
um, the chapter contribution is actually an income my brother who is um, a lecturer in philosophy at UEA um, and we were both invited to be part of um, a group called the Debating Nature's Value Network, um, which is a collaborative research group between uh, UEA and Anglia Ruskin University. And um, their kind of premise was to look into ideas around natural capital, but as part of um, the instigating of this group, they commissioned me to make an artwork. Um, so the discussion is around the artwork that I made, which is a film called The Flaming Rage of the Sea, um, and some of the other kind of political um, questions that arise around these discussions around natural capital. Um, just show a couple of things from that. So these are some stills from the film. Um, it's the, the film is based um, around the Cambridgeshire Fenland, which is an area that is largely below seawater. And um, the film is uh, kind of similar to some of the ideas perhaps that Lisa was talking about, about looking back to the past and a present condition to think about how we might behave in, in the future, particularly in this landscape that reveals um, how an adaptation to the land um, needs to be very present when it's um, in constant threat of being flooded. So the uh, next um, chapter is a collaborative work by Kelsey, Norast, um, Sally and Sarah. So we have Sally and Sarah um, both here. So perhaps Sally, if you want to start talking and then you can introduce me. Okay. Well, um, Sarah and I both um, responded to an open call from Naras and Kelsey, who were setting up an exhibition called The Archive and Contested Landscape. Um, so we do really need to give credit to them as being the kind of the key instigators of, of this. Um, and it was a um, um, a, a massive exhibition across um, at least three venues, I think. I think Michael took part as well. Um, and um, Sarah and I um, both connected our work with Naras in Basra. And um, Sarah will talk about hers, but mine was a walk that took place at the same time in Cambridge and in Basra, where people walked in a circle with a shared view of the moon um, and then wrote postcards to one another um, in response to the experience afterwards. So Sarah can talk about her contribution. Yes, uh, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm an artist based in Cambridge. And um, as Sally said, I've been part of a collaborative that we've been working on through geology and art. Um, which kind of came about through the archive and the contested landscape project, um, but is continuing currently. So we're still working on uh, on projects now. Um, but the work that I included or I submitted to the open call was called um, Shared Water, Contested Water. Um, and it was around the geopolitical issues of water um, uh, provision in Iraq. Um, Narast uh, lives in, in, uh, in Basra and at the time where we were putting the work together um, uh, Basra was unable to access uncontaminated water for various reasons and so uh, my work reflects on the kind of whole system kind of river catchment um, kind of concept really and uh, the importance of water in the Middle East. Um, and I guess that as a, an indicator of past environments too, which links into Narast. So um, yeah, as a, an artist, I'm also a geographer. So I kind of make a bit of a link back to the geology part of our, uh, our collaboration. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, and so the final chapter in the book is uh, by Stefano, if you would like to give a short introduction. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm Stefano. I'm an Italian artist. Um, I work with different media, but normally 
and mostly with video art, performance, installations. But in this case, it was a kind of also uh, interaction with the kind of the playground was the landscape with the, this powerful ray of light. It was a traveling project. This was the this the this is the project in the book. The title is the end of the border of the mind. It's a is because it's a metaphor about light. I was using the light in the real space in a very gigantic situation. It's like 15 kilometers. It was a traveling project between Italy to the over the Arctic Circle. And it's about the borders, the end of the border to go over and um, the borders. In, uh, after we can uh, tell more. Um, it's uh, of course about, uh, now I work a lot with the, the, the position of uh, the, the, this kind of competition and, uh, and um, war between, between human and the natural also. And, um, the anthropogenic interferences that I'm, I'm working now. Uh, yeah. Great. Thank Great. you, Stefano. Just stop the screen share. So thank you very much for the introductions. I think um, it's interesting from that starting to think about some of the connections between the work. And obviously, um, as the co-editors, Marina and I had a lot of discussions about the kind of interlacing of works. Um, and actually some of the ideas of how we wanted to put the book together, thinking of it as a kind of space, as a, as a exhibition, on a page. So there is this kind of toing and froing between some ideas um, and repetitions of some ideas being played out in different ways. So we've obviously had quite a few discussions around those ideas, but we would love to hear from you about um, some reflections on perhaps other works that you find um, a connection with what you have produced for the book. Um, so, I mean, perhaps we'll just start with you, Stefano, um, as you were talking about ideas of kind of borders and um, things that go over the edge of the border of something. Um, we we're wondering about some of the connections that you might see with some of the other contributors. Um, you know, I, I, I think I really love the, this project, the book, because it's a kind of, uh, it's, a, it's also interesting to see the you all here this kind of mosaic is very it's perfect about this kind of book. I think it's a, it's really a, a kind of every chapter can uh, give very a specific uh, view uh, that I, I really love like kind of every every part that because for example also uh, for example for, for example Ozana, uh, you are really think about the value of nature and. Um, and how we, and our position that, and, and like every, every part, like uh, Marina, the, the extinctions of the species. Mm -hmm. But now I, I'm uh, um, just the last, before the COVID, I was, um, in a, in a, I was working with a project. It was more, a bit more radical because I, I think about the, the our extinction, not the, about the, the other animals, but we are very, go to this direction and um, um, the value of water with, with, with Sarah was very, in, very important. Or with Kai, uh, it's funny that we, we are, what well, we play with, with, the, with, the, with the base, we, we, we put the trash somewhere under the carpet, you know, but it's in our home. Hmm? Um, yeah, uh, anyway, I really love the uh, all together. Mm? I think there are really, it's really kind of a very interesting mosaic. Mm? And um, yeah. Thank you. This <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps, Yeah, Camilla. Yeah, I think that it's a really master of the book because it's a uh, like a really constellation, constellation of a precise aesthetical language composed by many voices all together. And it's very uh, fluid with the fluidity, but also uh, 
in ecology, but uh, in languages of ecology. And it is a very strong word because it's a sort of a choral voice. So, uh, and the power system. And this voice is only a magic condition because we are living a so difficult moment and the magic, the connection with ecology is uh, so important and so definitely. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Um, uh, I think, uh, um, Marina, if you would like to maybe draw out a few of the connections. Yeah, um, I was thinking um, what resonated with me is what Lisa was saying that she was surprised to be invited to contribute to um, a book uh, about sustainability. And, and that's the thing that sometimes when we explore these themes of sustainability, they seem so vast and so interconnected. And sometimes we always associate sustainability with um, ecology and prob problems about ecocide or environmentalist problems. And we don't tend to think about the connections between work and labor and exploitation and how exploitation of hum between human beings and exploitation uh, of, the, of the resources are interlinked. Um, so that the, the mindset of the ex extractivism about whether it's natural resources, ideas of people's labors is, is similar, is the same. So sometimes we talk about um, decolonizing, sometimes we talk about sustainability, but there, there are so many connections there to make and to unpick. Um, and yeah, just, um, before I, I, Lisa, Lisa would like to say something, but I wanted to just um, just highlight the fact that the, the similarities and different approaches, but the making visible and um, things that are invisible and exploring materialities, and and also this this idea of um, of the landscape, but looking back to the past and in order to um, look at, at the future. So, so this idea that in sustainability you are always positioned in, in the past, present and future. And that's quite an interesting way to look at it, to be positioned as an artist. Yes, Lisa. Um, yeah, maybe what, what I was found interesting um, is that I think often in the kind of discussion around sustainability, it, it seems to be about ecology or nature. Huh? And it, it's just like humans are the ones destroying nature. And it's this, um, this almost kind of uh, bipolar, it's like humans here, nature there. And um, for me, it's always, we are as much part of nature as any anything else. Huh? And we're part at our industrial development, our digital development is all part of a natural evolution. And that in a way, um, what I'm, 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 I'm based in Germany now and I'm in, in Berlin and there's a region around Berlin uh, that's called uh, the Lausitz. And there's a, it's a huge area where um, uh, coal mining happened um, for, I know, the past 150 years. And now Germany has decided to get rid of coal. And uh, so there's a huge uh, discussion around the structural changes in that area. And the discussion uh, started where um, the people living in the area were not involved in the discussion. And it was basically the government deciding, okay, these and these are the things that need to happen. And this, this is what we need to do. And people who live there and have worked in the mines for, I don't know, years and years and years, uh, it's part of their kind of uh, social identity and their individual identity. And it's, uh, I find this, um, I find it really important to um, make sure that the people who have been part of this development in a, I don't want to judge whether coal mining is good or bad, but it's uh, that they were part of the process and they, they were part of where we are now and that it's valued in a way in a way that we say okay there's a um it's it's maybe coal mining or coal burning is not the the right way to go in the future but their contribution or the contribution of labor in that context 
is something that we have to value and maybe acknowledge that it had its part in our development. And maybe that's that's also maybe something to for me to to think about how can labor or work can be made more sustainable so that in the future we look back at our work and we say yeah this was actually we could contribute in a way that was uh, that makes the makes life better now or makes makes the climate uh, I don't know healthier in a way. Mm. Yes, Kai, did you want to comment? Yeah, uh, that just makes me think of our position as cultural workers uh, and as mm -hmm. laborers sort of on behalf of, well, um, interdisciplinary artistic approaches. Um, I wouldn't, you know, say the image or the text or whatever, but uh, that this conversation uh, we're trying to have is not a conversation with nature that would make it a very elitist philosophical conversation. Mm -hmm. It is a very hands-on real thing. It's, it's, uh, it's between us as human beings and what we're doing for each other so that we can still see ourselves in the future. For me, that's what sustainability means. It means being able to say, I can imagine myself being here. Um, we can imagine ourselves being here. And, how how do we how do we do that so mm. yeah it's interesting i mean these are obviously things that are, are kind of well you know let me hope to be drawing out through the kind of crossing over of discussions within the book um i did i mean lisa and kai you you both kind of mentioned that maybe see some relationship between your two um contributions and certainly kind of flicking through the book there are these moments when um the pages are, are full of image so that's very a kind of visual connection perhaps between your um two chapters but i wondered if if perhaps you wanted to make some specific connections with any other chapters uh, well maybe in particular i could say i think the reason for that is um maybe a, a suspicion that the text uh, is, uh, uh, is needs a lot more attention or um, is maybe a, a less fertile <laughs> place for the conversation to happen um, or a different way uh, perhaps for the conversation to happen uh, between human beings and different sort of levels of discussion that one can have uh, so that it doesn't end up just being an academic discussion. It doesn't just become a privileged discussion. Uh, it is something that uh, perhaps you can have uh, in, on, on, on multiple levels with different audiences. So uh, that, that's something that I, I, I see as a possible uh, common approach between our, our two chapters. And then, of course, uh, I really resonate with uh, Stefano's uh, border because uh, in my work I was trying to think through the notion of territoriality, uh, the crop mark or the rectangle that, you know, why, why are all books this shape? Why is the stuff behind me this shape? Why is the screen this, this shape? Uh, and in the end, there's something fundamentally human about that. There aren't uh, other species that make these shapes. We do this all the time. So. Uh, that notion of the border and the particular kinds of borders that we draw intellectually and that we then create um, sort of materially is quite fascinating to me. And then Camilla's notion of the elsewhere uh, as well, which she speaks about, uh, or the, the void rather, um, as the desert, uh, is also something uh, I was trying to think through, this idea of the blank page, that there is a nowhere or a nothing. Uh, specifically for me, having grown up in South Africa, uh, the African continent is generally sort of a blank spot in most people's imagination and has been in European imaginaries for centuries, the dark continent, but also just that it's nowhere. And we do the same thing with anything we send to the dump or throw into the dustbin and then it's gone sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, those other spaces 
when in ecology everything really is ever present, it's here all the time. Uh, there is no outside of ecology. Um, so, yeah, that notion. Mm. And then uh, also the life worlds, Fiona's idea of the different life worlds uh, of different species. Uh, in a sense, I, I think we live inside sort of these rectangular shapes mentally. Um, the book is, is, a, is something we live within, but we live in these rooms as well that are rectangular. Uh, there's something quite uh, human about that, that we just don't see. So for me, yeah, I was interested in, in making that visible in, in some way. There's, there's so many resonances everywhere. Yeah. I mean, this might be a nice moment to bring in uh, Michael because obviously you have a, uh, the, the chapter that is um, more like an essay that's based on the word and is about language. So uh, a, a kind of um, on the other side, perhaps to how Kai and Lisa are working. Yeah, well, I, I would just point out that, you know, we're always working inside sign systems. We're never in a tabula rasa and that every form shape, whether that's expressly textual, is always read, you know, that we, uh, uh, that everything we see is culturally determined. And that we actually see through a series of lenses, which are um, to a certain degree prescribed. And the, the, the point of the arts, to my mind, whether it's a poem, a painting, a sculpture, an intervention, a work of performance art, is to confuse this to take away that logical positivist um, overbearing interpretation and present us with something disorienting, which I think the book as a whole rather does. It, 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 it's what I really liked about it was the impossibility of gaining an overview. It, you didn't, you can't stand outside of it. So I'd be more than interested to hear Marina and Rosie what you felt as you were deeply um, inscribed within the composition process, but it doesn't seem to be a, a teleology, a governing narrative. It seems to be a work that, you know, to use Rambo's term, confuses the senses, which I found, you know, very enchanting. And actually, a, a kind of performance, perhaps, of the ecology itself as a wild system that obeys its own logic, that it grows from within, and its form is little more than an extension extension of content alone. Um, so it's full of the relationships between the chapters struck me as impossible to delineate or prescribe. It struck me as a series of folds, of overlaps, um, networks, rather than narratives or stories with their beginning, middle and end. And I thought on that level, it rather dramatized um, the biosphere, um, which I, I rather loved. And I, I just want to go back to Lisa's comment, actually, on, on her initial surprise. And as you were speaking, Lisa, I was just thinking of um, Felix Guattari's great book, The Three Ecologies, where he talks about the, the sites of the psyche, the social, and the more than human world that we call natural as each having their own ecologies, their own symbolic processes, their own discursive procedures. And then of course, so they overlap, that we cannot differentiate ourselves from one or the other. And, and crucially, that his, his notion of ecology really means the entire field of capitalistic power relations. And you're, you're talking about this um, perhaps desirable obsolescence of the coal fields in Germany and the need to honor and respect the continuities, the communities that were iterated within them over decades. And I, I think we had something similar in Britain in the 1980s with the attack on the, um, the coal fields by the Thatcher government. And what happened to those communities that were brought together into urban formations, specifically around the idea of industrial yield. And that when that purpose is taken away, entire populations and histories are rendered obsolete. Mm -hmm. Hence the chaotic condition of Britain today, I think, as we move into what is, I think, wrongly called a post-industrial society. We've merely outsourced mm -hmm. our dirty work to other countries. So I, I think, Lisa, your contribution is central and vital. 
Yes, wonderful. Um, thank you, Michael. And, and yes, you were wondering about how uh, Rosanna and I um, thought about uh, each contribution and how to order. And yes, uh, the presence, the absence of, of a narrative uh, is what maybe creates the space for other connections to be made. And, and the, so you have lines of um, lineas de fuga, eh? so, so the connections with the mud that uh, the collaboration of uh, Kelsey, uh, Sally, Sarah, and Arast brings uh, brings in. So, so we we have a, 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 a sort of small narrative of uh, imagining Narast coming from Basra with a suitcase uh, and the allowance of, of kilograms of the suitcase. She chose not to bring clothes but mud to analyze into Cambridge. So that kind of narrative with with the narratives of all this um, um, exploration of creation of objects and do we need to bring another more object into this world and that kind of thing so that that we had all these overlapping some foldings in the books as you well pointed out and the borders so all that exploration of the borders uh, that uh, uh, you know in including the animals, uh, uh, when we talk about animals, uh, borders are, um, are, are basically wrong because <laughs> for, for species they need uh, to roam from one country to the, to the other and they, the borders are getting in the way, like uh, Trump's wall and so forth that they are uh, preventing. Uh, yes, uh, there, there are so many foldings and overlapping in the book that create uh, conversations rather than narratives. So that's that's very interesting um yeah, so yes I think one thing that's been really exciting for us as well is is we conceived of it as something that we wanted to kind of develop in collaboration and we we wanted to offer people a space to produce a new work for the book and to not necessarily i've been describing them as chapters and they kind of fall in that way but to not necessarily kind of think of it as a book with chapter but you have these interfolding narratives and to offer that space to develop kind of new ideas and something that perhaps we didn't expect and, and have really embraced is that in doing that, the people that we started the conversations with then very often invited additional people to collaborate with them. So we actually, that kind of network has expanded and, and I'm glad that you kind of see that as it, it, the idea is not being contained solely within the publication, because I think that kind of unfolding of these ideas is what is what we really want, because, of course, you know, there is always a question of, of who is missing, what voices are missing, what else could have been included. And I think, you know, we had conversations around that as well. But I, I think some hope that even if they are not, you know, maybe some people haven't been invited to contribute their voices are still somehow within this kind of um, chain of discussion. So, um, and yes, one of those chapters is, is certainly the collaboration um, that Sarah is involved in. So if you would like to speak, so you put your hand up. <laughs> yeah, it was collaboration that kind of got me thinking again. Um, and I guess it was also thinking a little bit about, um, well, I guess fusing together some of the concepts from Stefano's chapter, Kai's chapter and Uli's, thinking about objects and thinking about boundaries. And I'm really interested in whether or not uh, objects can help to transcend some of those boundaries. So, um, you know, in interdisciplinary working, often some of the barriers are around terminology, around um, kind of language. And so I think that's what Kai was sort of alluding to in terms of images as maybe as a boundary object, maybe something, this is some, this is sort of theory kind of touching on kind of social sciences and, and infrastructures around Star and Griezmann and their idea of objects being able to transcend. And I just wonder whether anyone felt that the book was a bit of an object that, you know, was helping to transcend those boundaries really. Hi, did you want to say? Yeah, uh, I was going to say just that uh, one of the things that I wrote in, in the, the introductory text was just that um, the, the, the book itself has been both form and content in the history of unsustainable design. So it's promoted unsustainability to a certain extent. 
uh, and at the same time, it's promoting our ideas now. So uh, it's it's a very ambiguous object for me because of its carbon footprint, you know, because of the production, everything that goes into it, the human labor, um, as well as the, um, you mentioned the term natural capital uh, earlier on, Rosie, and um, the, uh, yeah, that makes it that makes it a very uh, conflicting thing to hold for me. I kind of I have to think about everything it's connected to that's uh, that I don't see, uh, and that as an artist that makes me want to make that visible. And at the same, yeah, and so so I think that it does that in in a beautiful way, um, on many levels, um, as a yeah as an object. Uh, um, the the thing the things that want us to to make them in a sense or uh, uh, that that question I often think of uh, James Hillman's question he's a um, Jungian analyst um, he says what is the object ask not what the object wants but what it needs uh, or in other words ask not what the image wants uh, um, talking about dream images in particular. So the bringing forth of the book, in a sense, what what did, did the book need from us uh, as an object, uh, or why do we design things? Why do we make them? Um, which I think is what what Sarah was was speaking to, in a sense. I think Uli had something to contribute there. Yeah, I saw your hand. <laughs> <over to start. laughs> um, Kai, what you said about the object. I mean, whenever I look at, um, at objects, no matter if it's an art object or pen, whatever, it's always, um, it's like a text object. is always text telling us about ways of organization. And um, in, in my case, when I started to work with porcelain, like uh, five years ago, I wanted to work with the raw material which I was interested in uh, from, um, you know, researching about globalization and everything and trying to find a material which can lead me through centuries, which can free me from the present and also leads me to the, you know, to the past. And as I said, making objects, it's always organizing information. And for me, you know, being part of this group was, it's, it was a surprise because Angelica uh, was invited with her sustainability uh, blog. And because we had these conversations on very existential, how to survive, how to live. And she got interested in my way of trying to survive as a female artist in the 21st century. She compared it with um, trying to survive uh, in Borneo, Highland Borneo, in the jungle. And out of this conversation came this porcelain I did, this jungle porcelain, which is also a little bit featured in here. Um, what I found interesting on the process, it was um, hard to understand the way you have interfered by editing the book. But I found now, I find this is the most interesting part for me on this project how much uh, you form this object out of everything else we do and I understood that my my contrib contribution with Angelica it's just um, a part of a material and this I like it's part of this object and even it's hard I mean I learn anytime I take the book in my hand I learn about um, meaning of materials you use and i find it quite interesting to see you all here now because i know that we all have like an analog analogical life we do our stuff writing books making objects creating um, environmental installations but we are all part of a surface and it's a surface which is maybe quite far from what we do in our daily lives is this raw surface we create all together. 
I think that's really interesting. It might be a, a good moment to um, move the discussion on because we've been talking about the kind of the book as the whole and the connections, but um, there are individual um, contributions in a, in a way and we all have evolving practices. So perhaps if you could, um, I mean, we'll start with you, Uli, if, if you like, um, how, how the work has evolved since the publication for you and Angelica. Are you still collaborating or has the work that you did together kind of um, stopped at this point? Or yeah, if you would like to speak about how the work's kind of evolved since this, since this. I would say my, yes. Um, Hard to say because Angelica and my connection is based on conversations and is based on recognize each other in what we do. And this was the, actually the, the first and the last time until now that we did this collaboration, which served for us as another way to, to go deeper into our conversation and to come up with something together. We, we made a video which is still uncut and uh, I was thinking about, because you were inviting us for this uh, online uh, exhibition, maybe to that I and Angelica, we will make the editing of that video to, to go deeper into this uh, communication we do have with each other on our works coming from very different angles. And it hasn't stopped. It's, um, I find it quite difficult to uh, to follow, you know, to follow really the content of the book in combination with what we really do. But we, I, I like it because it's hard to grab. And I like the, the overlapping, the overlapping part. I mean, I, I saw, I'm interested in, in the border seam, I'm interested in the material, you know, with the clay, this, this, the water. So it, that's a random, it's like a basket full of stuff. And I find it interesting that we, I mean, Angelica and I, when we worked on our contribution, we had quite an idea of what we like to communicate about. And then through the editing process, you did something very different out of it. And now it's interesting um, to go on after having this conversation and seeing you all, especially, understanding much better the, the you know all your contributions uh, adding again something to this conversation to this surface to this discursive surface I think at that point we should also um, credit our designer Clara Block who um, uh, we worked with really closely on this because we did obviously have contributions that were quite very in the way that um, they were using text and imagery together and we invited her as a as a designer to be quite you know open and creative mm -hmm. with that as well so some of those um, and maybe particularly with your mm -hmm. of this kind of interlacing of two different works and and we we gave her quite a lot of free reign with how those images could kind of interlock and interlace mm -hmm. and I think we wanted um, the design of the book to to do something that did um, bring out this idea that perhaps one, one idea didn't stop when another one started. So there is this uh, kind of repetition again of some of the works where she uses this kind of um, overlaying of imagery or where she places the, the images so they spread from one page to the next, this kind of bleed from one thing to another. Um, Perhaps uh, uh, Sally and Sarah, as, as a, another collaborative um, grouping, if you could um, speak a little bit about how the works have um, developed since, since the raw publication, um, whether you as a group are still working together or if you've taken kind of individual works um, to another place um, since raw. Now, I was thinking as people were talking how I think the book has kind of activated something for us. I think it, I don't know if Sarah agrees, but I think it may have been significant in actually um, enabling the collaboration to really move forward. Um, and we are actually, um, it's a, a parallel process, I guess, to Raw. We're taking the kind of the story of Naras bringing the suitcase of mud 
um, into uh, the creation of, um, of a walk. We were due to do it last year for Cambridge Festival, which was cancelled. So we're doing now an online walk, and as an audio walk, but it's developed into exploring um, ideas of mud. In a sense, it's become, I think the focus on the kind of um, the ecological aspect of it perhaps has, has, has deepened through that process. So we are working very closely with Shema as well, who's um, Iraqi, um, and, but living in France. And um, yeah, so we are, it's called Mesopotamian Mud, a journey through voice and vessel. Do you want to say a bit more, Sarah? <laughs> yeah, I can do. Um, yeah, so I think we have had this really interesting discussion about the materiality of mud and thinking about um, the value. So that kind of links a bit to Rose's kind of comments about that nature's value um, because mud is just your soil or whatever it is, um, you know, it's so vitally important to us as a, uh, as a civilization, yet we, you know, we refer to it as dirt or, you know, kind of, yeah, we, we dismiss it somewhat. Um, or take it for granted um, and so we've been really kind of we've spent a long time thinking about what the language was around this material that we were working with that Naras is working with in the field I'm working with in my practice that Sally's um, work was walking on you know essentially the earth as a, you know, a large part of what what our practice is about um, as individuals but also as a collective um, and so we yeah we plumped on mud because we felt that that was a it was a, it was something childlike about it and something primal and um and yeah a little bit more evocative than soil or earth or you know other words that kind of had more specific meanings mm. but yeah still very much working together and apart and kai did you have a comment on that uh, yeah, I can make a connection to something I've been working on uh, since then as well, because it also involves mud. <laughs> uh, I made uh, the, the the initial book was actually meant to be a sketch. So the the visual research was really meant to be research towards a longer work. And I made the uh, uh, another work, which has got mud <laughs> uh, on the opening page. As well. I'll show you, there's the mud. <laughs> And it kind of uh, looks at it, yeah, sort of different scales um, of its of the existence of the particle, really, um, in um, in the book, um, trying to relate the paper particle and the ink particle to this thing of dirt, really, which is mud. Um, so uh, at the end of the day, materiality is just dirt, but then we recontextualize it, and um, and one moment it's on your plate and the next moment it's on the floor and you won't eat it anymore but it's the same thing so um, I, i'm kind of curious about uh, that and i've made various other books since then there's a little one as well and they all form my work which ended up being called after crop marks and vanishing points so i was like well okay what's uh, it's it's now called everything and nothing <laughs> because it kind of defies language in that sense and that references these elsewheres as well which are these dumping grounds for all the things we don't understand so we're just like there's no word for it sometimes we use expletives you know to, to kind of describe that because language fails us and um yeah so that's that's what i made um since then it kind of grew into into that thank you kai and um, perhaps Camilla, I can see a connection there as well. I mean, you're not dealing with mud so much, but this, this, the materiality of the ground, the earth. Um, if you could speak a little bit about how um, things have developed since um, the raw chapter. Yeah, absolutely. The landscape of the desert is a massive, evocative state and space. Uh, echoes of void is a strongly evocative, essential primitive, almost mystical body of work. The artistic practice and research of Balestra was not merely an aesthetic proposition. It was a way of defining the role of art and the role of the artist now. 
uh, in this difficult moment, undergoing a dramatic change of the state of the society. Maria Rebecca had pursued a pioneering course in which experimentation and the ethics of ecology had been a constant. She was a majestic artist. And I tried to, to take a part of one of the last interview that uh, um, Vanilla Edizioni realized, interview her one month before. This book, uh, the name of this book, uh, A Casa Tutti Bene. Maria Rebecca tells in this interview, I use this period of Corona to take stock of the work done up to now and to reorient my future and my artistic practice. The sense of fragility, the tragedies of the death, the space-time suspension, implicit in this collective experience, fashioned me to take a greater responsibility. All through, my work is already socially committed and attentive to ecology and the change of the nature and the environment issues. In the future, it will be more and more stronger ethical, consistent with ecology, sustainability, and aim at the social transformation. He had a, a long idea about uh, her practice, and I would like to relate an exhibition about uh, Echoes Void in Italy in the next month, recording the majestic work of this artist. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Um, I'm reflecting on Rebecca Maria's work as well. Um, perhaps, uh, Stefano, you could speak a little about how, how your um, work uh, has developed. Uh, you did show a few pieces of another publication that you've been in since, um, but perhaps specifically some of the ideas of the end of the order, how that's kind of carried through in some of the work um, since the publication date. Oh, uh, you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because the, the end of the border is really part of my, uh, it's kind of a method because I was uh, starting with this kind of traveling project already in 2006. And the title of the project was Bird Flu Fogel Grippe. It was about the, the the avian influenza was my first traveling project. The concept is very important. In, in, in that case, was a van was empty because uh, it was a virus. I was transporting the virus through Europe during the pandemic, during the uh, panic moment. Funny was not very terrible, but people was already was start to think about. Um, that was the, the danger of a pan, of pandemic situation. And uh, after the, the end of the border, just last year, this year, till now, I was working with another project, was a, it's kind of spin-off because everything is quite connected. And, but um, I was trying this project before, I was in uh, November in uh, 2019, in Berlin, with the project, the title of the project is The Time of the Flood. And at some point, I was uh, in, in January in Berlin and uh, the pandemic situation was starting to, to appear. And my project was, was exactly perfect fit on the situation. Because the flood is this, this is the time of the flood that we are complete, we are really, so close to this idea of this kind of uh, biblic situation that is not just a virus, but is like all the all the condition of uh, our situation. But now uh, I'm working on the, in, with a book that will come out soon, very soon. 
and this is another kind of border. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the specific project uh, with the with the light before was was nothing. At some point, that was used also uh, another project was before was after the 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 the, the using this super powerful beam. I was used a, a infrared camera for capture the energy. It was invisible. It was another travel ar around Europe, around the world. In this case, during the COVID time, I was able to stay all the year. I was stay between <clears throat> Berlin, Vienna, Rome, Venice. And now I have just yesterday, uh, I reopened an exhibition in uh, the CCA in Tel Aviv. Because now in Israel, they reopen everything, luckily, yesterday. So, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. But after, I, I, and I have a good news for a develop altogether. Very nice. Good. Um, Lisa, maybe if you could speak about how the work has developed or um, other works that you've been working on since the raw publication. Yeah, um, yeah, I've really made quite a lot of works that were about work, work and labor. Uh, one of them was called uh, Why Work? Um, <laughs> and it was a, um, it was a, a thumbprint. So the paper I work normally with is uh, not acid free. So it changes color with exposure to UV light. And I made this um, mask that had the, the letters Why Work um, printed on it like a transparency. And then I laid it um, in the sun. So I let the sun work for me basically. And uh, the, the and it was at, at a residency in Estonia in a very small town called Narva. It's right at the Russian border. And it was the town that was heavily, it, it only ex existed because of uh, textile industry from the like mid 19th century. And they recently, the, the textile factory had gone uh, bankrupt and basically the town was out of work. And it, it only occurred to me that when I arrived and I put up this work that it was probably one of the, I was kind of embarrassed doing this kind of work because here I come as an artist doing a residency over a month, having these, uh, proposing these ideas of this I know, laying in the sun and let somebody else work or let, I don't know, let your money work or let let, let the world work or whatever. Um, so that was, um, but it, I think it kickstarted something for me. It was a moment where I, um, all of a sudden I didn't have anything to do. It's like the sun was making the work and I could do something else in the meantime. So I started, I don't know, I took my watercolors with me and I just started making some, I don't know, watercolor doodling. So it, it was something that is what never entered my practice in a way. It wasn't art, but all of a sudden I could, uh, I don't know, I could let go a little bit and I started thinking about other things. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been thinking quite a bit about um, the, maybe the, the concept of unconditional basic income and how that might change the concept of work uh, in the future with uh, automation and digitization, making more and more uh, jobs kind of uh, useless for, 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 for humans. Yeah? So it's, um, and, and what could we do with the time that becomes available and frees up? Um, oh, I think I'm, can you still hear me? I think my internet connection is not very good. Yeah, no, we can still hear you. Yeah, I think that's very uh, okay. 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 interesting as well of, um, th you know, thinking about some, this different relationship people have been having with time or the time that they have over the last year in light of the pandemic. So yeah, it's very interesting. Perhaps, um, Michael, yeah. if you could let us know what you've been working with. Yeah, I, I, I've turned towards um, um, questions of urban ecology. Um, I'm making a film um, um, that draws on Dante's um, Inferno and the return 
to the fetid city. And I'm collaging this with images of nine elms um, on the banks of the Thames, which I, I, it's, it's worth looking at if, if none of you have been down there. It's a good afternoon out in terms of um, just what turbo capitalism has done to London in terms of sheer arrogance, ugliness, waste, and tastelessness. It's a quite extraordinary um, vista. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in critiquing this. Um, but, I, but I guess also in my work, I'm probably now as, as interested in how we address the fact that we just do not have the institutional infrastructure to act upon the knowledge that, that has emerged over the last few years in terms of the damage we, 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 we continue to do to our biosphere. Um, and thinking about some of the great revolutions in thought that have taken place in the last five years. You know, we've had Me Too, we've had Black Lives Matter, we've had, since the book was commissioned, Extinction Rebellion, these fantastic bottom-up, grassroots, energized movements that have created changes in representation, in cultural practices, um, they're probably the, the, the most fundamental change is that necessary uh, within the field of, of capitalistic relations within the economy, which of course XR really challenges. And for my part as an academic, you know, what, what can we do about this? Because our university as an institution is hopeless in terms of its investment within these damaging systems. And, and at Cambridge, where, where, where I'm a lecturer, this idea that this university has been preparing people for administrative power and therefore reproducing the system for decades and decades, if not centuries. And that what can we do as educated people charged with exploring the possibilities of, of new knowledge? How can we create institutions that are more sympathetic, exciting, uh, less draining financially, emotionally, psychically, and how we can rebuild. And so I've, I'm, a, I'm the convener of um, an experimental university called the New School of the Anthropocene, which attempts to merge the creative and the critical in engaging with this question of uh, systemic social inequity, as well as ecological dysfunction. So my energies are quite dispersed, I guess. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Marina, if you would perhaps like to let us know how your work has been developing since the publication. Yeah, since the publication, um, of course, for me, the publication was my individual contribution, but also the contribution of the book as a whole, uh, calculating it with you. And um, since then, uh, my individual work um, has been developing into thinking about um, what is it that I want this, this exploration with other species of the proximity and distance of emotionally, politically, psychologically, um, and geographically, physically uh, as well. So, so what does it mean? And, uh, and I arrived at this concept of holding space. So so what does it mean to hold space for another species? What's it, what does it mean to hold sp space for one another? And the idea of the book as a holding space for these conversations. And, and that moved on a little bit. Uh, so this holding space kind of transformed into questioning the space of the rural, which is what I, what I do most of my field work, and the space of the wild. And how these things, where do they touch? who are the gatekeepers and how the animals are trapped in, in these different spa spaces. How do, do they um, negotiate our desire for space? So, uh, so that, that, that kind of moved on in, in that sense. And I'm involved, so this is, um, I'm involved in, cre in cre that's going to happen in, in two years' time, uh, uh, this um, symposium and, and uh, uh, residency for artists about the, the wild and the rural and, and how that, this contested space, how is that, uh, you know, 
just playing out uh, in, in whatever. So that, that will be in grass, Grassworks and with Grassworks and hopefully um, the Norwich University of the Arts where I am also a visiting lecturer. So that's how it has moved on. And um, well, it is only fitting that I ask you, Rosanna, how, how has your work moved on since the publication? <laughs> Um, thanks, Rina. Um, so obviously, in terms of the chapter of developing that as a conversation, there's um, still kind of ongoing work um, from the network. Um, and thinking about, I guess, thinking about the kind of conversational aspects of, of um, using this within my work. So um, the film itself has um, been shown in a number of different places, and I've been very interested to think about how a work that is kind of exploring a very specific local environment, a kind of spoken um, to people internationally, uh, which is what I was hoping it would do in terms of revealing this, this um, I guess, undercurrent of water that could rise at any point. Um, and since then, I've been working on another film that actually was kind of um, serendipitous that when we had the book launch in Venice, it was just during the time when the Venice was very flooded. Um, so I was um, started making this um, film, particularly in the kind of high end um, shopping district of Venice to see this flooding of all of these shops. At the moment, I'm trying to pin down how to work with sound, really trying to work with things kind of remotely. So I have some ideas again of, of um, carrying people's voices through song and, and through conversation and speech, but um, how how to work with that and re record it um, remotely. So that's, yeah, that's kind of where things are um, for me at the moment. Um,